Welcome to Movie Brawl. All right, everybody, welcome to the first episode of Movie Brawl, the movie podcast discussion show where we discuss our favorite movies, maybe even some of our not so favorite movies, and debate them back and forth on which one reigns supreme. And for this inaugural episode, we're going to be talking about The Terminator from 1984 versus Terminator 2 Judgment Day from 1991. And in the future, it could be sequels, it could be remakes, it could be unofficial rivals like The Exorcist versus The Omen, it could be movies with the same director, movies with the same lead actor. We're going to have some fun, try to find some ways to pit movies against each other and see what comes out the other end. My co-host for this episode is Mr. Rudy from Gen X Reviews and Root Advice. What's up, sir? What's up, Cody? Thanks for having me on this inaugural episode. Ter I need to talk Terminator 1 and 2. Dude, mm -hmm. I went to the movies. I saw these both as a young child <laughs> in the 80s and early 90s. So, dude, I am psyched for this. I can't wait. So let's do That's this. That's why I brought you in, because you were there. I was there. <laughs> I, had I'm watch them. I had to watch them <laughs> later on and just imagine what it was like to see them in the theaters. Oh, man. A wonderful experience. Can't wait to do this. Oh, yeah. It's going to be cool, too, because Terminator 2, uh, in my local theater, they have a uh, flashback cinema where every single week on Wednesdays and Sundays they have an old school film. And Terminator 2 is going to be in the theater actually this week that we're recording this, this Wednesday nice. and this Sunday. So I'm probably going to check that out on Sunday. Awesome. Awesome. Absolutely. All right, guys. So the way that this is going to work is we're going to have five different rounds. We're going to talk about the story, the characters, the effects, the villain, and the legacy of these two movies. We're going to discuss them all at length. We're going to talk back and forth about which ones we prefer, if there's anything that we don't like about them, and you know, ha have a friendly debate back and forth. And at the end of each round, we'll each assign a point to which movie we think reigns supreme in that category. And then after those five rounds, we'll tally it up and figure out who is the winner of the first movie brawl. Starting off at round one, we're going to talk about story. And so we got, we'll start with Terminator from 1984, obviously. So okay. story of this one is actually pretty simple for as convoluted as some of the lore gets later on in this series, or even in just the sci-fi action genre as in and of itself. Uh, you have Killing Machine sent back to murder this waitress that is going to give birth to the the savior the messiah if you will the person that's going to eventually overthrow ai and a human savior is sent back to protect her short sweet simple to the point and much like uh early james cameron films the the concept is always really simple and he just yeah. builds excellence out of that and it's also a very low budget movie too i mean it yeah. didn't cost a lot of money to make either yeah, it doesn't. And, and it was kind of a, it, you know, this was James Cameron's first movie as far as like his official filmography. Like technically he did Piranha 2 and he mm -hmm. worked on a few other ones. So he's kind of already cut his teeth on lower budget films. But this was one of those movies that had a low budget, but did so much with it. I mean, mm -hmm. this movie was groundbreaking for a lot of the things that it did, both with the story concepts as well as effects that we'll talk about later. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, it kicks off. You got you got Sarah Connor played by the great Linda Hamilton. And she's just a regular old lady. She's just a waitress, waitress going about her day. And then suddenly this machine shows up in, I believe it's L.A., right? If I'm yeah, not mistaken. LA. Okay, yeah, mm -hmm. it's L.A. Shows up in L.A. in 1984. And then Kyle Reese shows up just behind this machine. And I, if you watch the movie for the first time, too, it's not even really completely clear on what either of their motivations are. If you watch it blind, it's just two people one of them's big one of them's medium sized right. are there they're finding clothes they're finding things and then they both descend on sarah connor in this nightclub and that's when it's revealed what the motivations are one of them to murder her one of them to protect her with mm -hmm. that iconic line of come with me if you want to live uh-huh uh-huh what i love about that movie is that again this is arnold's really one of his first major movies he does he did some other movies before like you know i think hercules in new york and other things but this is his mm -hmm. first role and again, I remember seeing it as a kid. I didn't know who he was. Nobody knew who he was, but just the presence of him, just this large person that couldn't be stopped and couldn't be killed, couldn't be reasoned with, couldn't be bargained with, nothing right. <laughs> uh, it Just to see this guy just, just coming after these people, not stopping no matter what they did, it was terrifying mm -hmm. as a kid seeing this. And I think, of course, you see the movie, you grew up with it, and then you see it as an adult. You lose that feeling, that connection, but I remember seeing it again as a kid 
it was legitimately terrifying to me. It felt like a horror movie. Uh, I know people like to confuse yeah. it as an action movie, but it felt like a, an unstoppable murderer coming yeah. after somebody who was just defensiveless and having this guy who's vulnerable and getting injured along the way. Is he going to last? It's very suspenseful, and I think it kind of sets the tone when the Terminator comes back, and it's systematically, he doesn't know where she is. He just knows Sarah Connor is in the city, so old school, he goes to the Yellow Pages, and he just <laughs> looks for the page that says Sarah Connor. Like, There's four of them, so he just systematically is just going after each one of these women and killing them, and mm -hmm. it, you know, one of them's a mother, and he's just got no remorse, so again, the tone is very scary. Again, if you've never seen it, again, it's aged, but I think it's aged beautifully, but it, for me as a kid it was legitimately terrifying yeah i've gotten a lot of flack over the years for not only calling the original terminator a horror film but i actually classify it as a slasher film uh, I, I think yeah. that if you if people don't like to use that term whenever there's guns at play which is the most used weapon of the t-800 right. but for me if he was using a knife we wouldn't even be having this debate it's obviously True. a slasher film. I mean, he goes through and he, the first thing that he does is puts his fist through a dude's chest. Yeah. And like, and, uh, you know, it, it, it's gory. It is very dark. It is very uh, horror themed. The rest of the franchise from Terminator 2 onwards is very clearly predominantly action. And I think it's yeah. the franchise overall being action that kind of makes people hesitant to call it a horror film. But it, it yeah, mm -hmm. very much so that this is it, it's. Michael Myers, it's Jason Voorhees without the mask trying to take exactly. down the victim. And uh, that and that victim is Sarah Connor. Mm -hmm. And baked into this is this really interesting love story because you have Kyle Reese, who is the protector that's been sent back by John Connor, who is the, the son of Lyndall Hamilton's character that's eventually going to lead the resistance to overthrow Skynet, the AI, the one that sent back the Terminator. And so John Connor sends this human back to protect his mother and throughout the movie you start to get hints that you know that he knows a little bit more than he's letting on or there's something else to right. be revealed there and you get this moment about halfway through the film where the action and the terror has calmed down for a bit you know the t-800 is nowhere to be found and yeah. you start to see that love connection kind of come through mm -hmm. and uh yeah the, the love blooms and you get kyle reese that reveals that you know he's, he's always had her picture that mm -hmm. John gave him and he's always had this infatuation with you know the 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 mother of the resistance mm -hmm. and they fall in love with each other and it, it's it's something where it's it's just this little isolated sequence in the movie that you could almost remove entirely and it's not like the movie changes right. a lot but it's so integral for those two characters mm -hmm. and so you have this this horror movie this slasher this action packed film filled with all this sci-fi and then this really interesting love story uh, that once you start to get into that and get towards the end of the film where you have Kyle Reese that eventually has to sacrifice himself to protect Sarah. Sarah suddenly rises to the occasion to be this warrior that she's told the entire movie, like, you're the mother of resistance. Yeah. You're the person that taught him how to fight and taught him how to shoot and taught him how to hide. And she's like, I'm a waitress. What are you talking about? Like, that's mm -hmm. not me. It can't be me. Right. And you see shades of that in the third act with her attitude and especially at the, you know, end. Especially at the end, you know, when she finally crushes the T-800 down, mm -hmm. you're terminated fucker and like stuff like that. You just finally get that badassness out of her. Yeah. And then you get the final reveal that she's going to be pregnant with John Connor and Kyle Reese is actually the father. Mm -hmm. And then it creates this whole time paradox scenario in there that gives you things to talk about and to think about after the movie's over of, so did John send him back knowing that that's going to be his father? Did he hesitate to send his father back? What was his relationship with this guy and if, that he presumably knew from a young kid that is his father? And how does that screw with your head? And mm -hmm. so many things that just has this really interesting little time loop aesthetic to it that can so easily crumble a movie with logic. But again, the simplicity of this first film just keeps it very clean and very tight to where it, it's so effective. Yeah, and, and again, keeping on track, what you said, where it's story, all these events happen over, like, I believe three to four days. It, it's not a long time. It's very brief, mm -hmm. maybe shorter than that. I think uh, it's but, all one night. Yeah, maybe one or two. I don't know. But mm -hmm. uh, it, it's very, it, it could have been done and done horribly. But mm -hmm. again, when you look at the performances, the screenplay and everything, kind of how it's fleshed out, there's really no, there's moments to breathe in the movie, but it's done accurately where it's not too long or dragged out. And again, you have enough story and exposition and you know, just believing the relationship and believing that love that they have. So, mm. uh, again, it's a fantastic movie, dude. I love it. Again, it's a classic.
Yeah, absolutely. And something else in regard to the romance, too, because I saw a movie today uh, that I won't name where I, I had a little bit of an issue of the romance feeling a bit rushed, even though it's just that one sequence because they've been through so much together. And it's kind of like one of the, like love blooms in the battlefield type of yeah. uh, a theme in there. There's never a point, even though it's such a small segment of the movie where I don't buy them having a link like that right. and them uh, kind of having this 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 fate that they are bound to each other by. Mm -hmm. um and, and even though that even post romance it's still very short-lived and we'll get into terminator 2 but i feel like that 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 sequence was so strong for both of them and that night was so strong that you can believe that this guy that you only knew for mm -hmm. less than a day has such an impact on you and sticks with you through to terminator 2 yeah definitely definitely yeah so we'll move on to terminator 2 now so the story with this one, continuing on from the first film, same characters, same timeline, everything like that, direct sequel. And essentially, this is carrying on the same concept where Skynet has now sent a Terminator back to murder John Connor himself, where the first film, it was we got to murder the mother before the kid is born. Second yeah. film, after he's born, we're just going to take him out directly. And just like the first film, the Resistance sends back a protector as well. And the genius of this movie which uh, were you there for the advertisements? Do you even remember like the oh, yeah. trailers and everything? Did they reveal no the twist? They did not. No, they, the only time we uh, the trailer, the teaser trailer, I feel it was one of the best ever because it just shows like the uh, assembly line of them making a T-800. Then you see Arnold at the end, his eyes open, then T-2, Judgment Day. But mm -hmm. I, the only time it gave anything away was the Guns N' Roses, You Could Be Mine music video. Mm -hmm. is when you know he has john in the bike and he's fighting this cop and like hey what's going on here so it did kind of spoil it as uh, far as him being the good guy this time and that was the only thing gotcha so yeah, it, again if you are, if you were blessed enough to watch this movie blind <laughs> which if you're watching this podcast we're going to completely ruin for you yeah uh, but <laughs> it, you have this this genius twist of a scenario which is both yeah. just a really nice uh, subversion of expectations as well as kind of a reflection of Arnold Schwarzenegger's star power by this time. Oh, yeah. uh, where you know Arnold Schwarzenegger descends and he, he comes through the little time portal. And then just like the first film, you get a guy who's much smaller build that comes through and the movie holds off for the first 10 or 15 minutes of really showing you what these guys' motivations are. They try to find clothes. You know, give me your clothes, your boots, and your motorcycle. Uh, <laughs> then you got the other guy getting clothes, dressing up as a cop, both trying to find John Connor. And we get introduced to John Connor, who's played by Eddie Furlong, young little shitty kid. We'll be honest. He's kind of a yeah. dickhead. You know, he's one of those young, angsty teenagers that doesn't have a mom and hates his foster parents and does everything they tell him not to do and is flying around listening to Guns N' Roses on his little motorbike and but he uh, was cool because again i saw yeah. this as a freshman in high school and the fact that he can hack computers and get money and go to the arcade <laughs> and spend hundreds of dollars that was cool we always wanted to be that kid man like how did he do that man i want that computer that he's got in his backpack <laughs> yeah exactly i won't get caught uh yeah. and then you have this sequence in the mall in this arcade where just like in the first film in the the nightclub all motivations are revealed where it's very slow motion you have the t-1000 walking towards john connor in his highway or this hallway he turns around mm -hmm. then the t-800 is coming at him and you could see this moment of recognition on his face like he knows what's going on but he doesn't know like who's yeah. are they both here and then you get the shotgun and get down and that is the one moment where it's like oh he's here to protect him and yeah. so you get arnold schwarzenegger as the t-800 the machine sent back mm -hmm. to protect john connor yeah uh, and and so then the rest of the film becomes kind of like a boy and his terminator and it's uh it's about fatherhood uh pseudo fatherhood foster fatherhood whatever you want to call it and uh very much questions the humanity in machines where the first one was very definitively about the evil of ai and the evil of uh building out technology too much and the mm -hmm. the relentless mission that a terminator will have or he will not stop until it is achieved and then in this one is about john connor very much challenging all of that challenging the programming and, and seeing if there is humanity inside of a machine yeah and then we find out the more he hangs out with humans the more he learns so mm -hmm. then he try to instill that humanity in him and we do get a more human terminator at the end uh and i don't want to spoil the ending but I was very fortunate uh, about two years ago. I introduced my kids to the Terminator part one, Terminator two and mm -hmm. seeing 
they were totally blind. I never showed them these movies. They didn't know anything about it. So Terminator 1, I remember seeing it with them. And they were scared at moments of like, oh, my God, this guy is scary. Oh, my God. And then two part two starts. And I didn't tell them what was going to happen. And just to <laughs> see that so reaction, awesome. go, oh, the cop's going to save him right now. I'm like, I don't know. Just watch. They didn't know. So just to see that reaction in the hallway in the back of that mall when they're just John Connor's like looking both ways and he says, get down to see my daughter go. Oh, he's a good guy now. Like, oh, that that's cool. Yeah. <laughs> just to see that reaction was cool. Because, again, if you didn't know that setup, it's it's one of the best uh, switches to have one of the most terrifying villains. Mm -hmm. of all time. It's like, like you said, it's like having Michael Myers as a good guy. Yep. <laughs> Protecting you like that. How, how godly crazy is that? But that concept and having this indestructible machine in uh, Arnold protecting the, the savior of mankind. But you also see that he's obsolete because this new Terminator is just miles ahead of him as far as technology goes. Mm -hmm. And again, at the time, seeing this in the movies, it's a, it's a weird thing, Cody, because I don't think anybody has. I don't think any of us have had this experience yet as moviegoers. When that T-100, that, and the T-9000, I'm sorry, Robert Love Patrick, that. when he was in the uh, ground on that tile floor and he just kind of rises, right? Mm -hmm. It starts turning into that cop. To hear the theater go, ooh. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that was groundbreaking and breathtaking because we had never seen that before. So again, the leaps in technology and just the, the range and just the, the qualities that this new Terminator had just showed how Arnold is kind of vulnerable, like Cal Reese. Like he's strong, he can protect him, but he's not invulnerable. So yeah. it added another layer of attention uh, to the the experience, which I appreciate. Yeah, and it, it also like all the advancements of the villain in this film make it for a much different path towards the actual termination because he can yeah. mimic the look and the voices of solid objects. Uh, he can you know, stabbing weapons. weapons, he can turn into knives and whatever. <laughs> so he doesn't even need to find a gun to terminate. Uh, and so it's 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 much more of a deadly killer, but also much more of an elusive killer where the first mm -hmm. one, you know, once you know the Terminator, what he looks like, the dude sticks out like a sore thumb in the room. <laughs> you know, Arnold Schwarzenegger is a monster. And this guy looks a lot more frail and he can he could be your mother. He could be he could look like Arnold Schwarzenegger. He could look like, you know, your yeah. foster mother, a cop, a friend, whatever. And you don't know it's him until it's too late and you're done. Did and you know so that Lance, it, Lance Hendrickson was supposed to be the Terminator in part one? Because he uh, was just a, a regular dude and he mm -hmm. would kind of blend in with everybody and you wouldn't know who he was. Mm -hmm. I, I remember, know that the story was that Arnold Schwarzenegger was supposed to be reading for Kyle Reese. Yeah, but he got more intrigued by the Terminator and wanted to try that. And mm -hmm. uh, the, he he always tells a joke that James Cameron was like, "Yeah, let him do it. He already looks like he talks like a robot." Uh, so it was uh, <laughs> it, kind of a l nice little twist of fate there. What could have been? What could have been Imagine. if Arnold Schwarzenegger wasn't the T eight hundred? So yeah, you go on this this uh, this journey where now that. You know the the sides have been chosen, and you got the T eight hundred protecting John Connor against this T one thousand, who's relentlessly pursuing them both. Uh, they have to go, and they have to break Sarah Connor out of this uh, asylum, basically this mental hospital, mm -hmm. and it it continues her character arc from the first film of being this warrior, and she's continued to just harden herself, yeah, and it obsesses quite literally over Judgment Day and over the apocalypse and over her fate, her son's fate, and the loss of Kyle Reese. And she's a broken person, to put it lightly, mm -hmm. in this film. And so they have to break into this hospital and get her out, which creates an interesting scenario because not only do they have to break her out of this highly security building, but also that's going to put a gigantic target on their back with the authorities. And you have to have this situation where Sarah Connor has to face this monster that pursued her in the worst night of her life almost yeah. killed her and her son and did in fact kill the love of her life and she's supposed to believe that he's now a protector when she's mm -hmm. done nothing but be hardened to believe that there's there's nothing good in machines that it's only yeah. evil and only only destruction and so that's one of the themes of the movie that that resonates so strong with me in the second one is not only just that pseudo fatherhood role that the t800 has with john connor and never having his father actually there to raise him but also, while trying to find the humanity in machines, John Connor pulling the humanity back out of his mother, who yeah. has pretty much extinguished all of it. Yeah, uh, where she's given up hope. She's given up. Uh, she's almost given up humanity herself, and, and and given up on on human beings to just focus on this one day that's going to be supposedly coming. 
Yeah. And, and I know we're, we're talking about characters later, but uh, Sarah mm-hmm. Connor and, L- and Linda Hamilton, the, the transformation, I, I mean, just to go from the original movie and just seeing what she did to her body mm-hmm. is was like, wow. Everybody was like, ooh, ah, when she was doing the pull-ups in the movie because she just looked, she was cut. Yeah. But not only that, I think she has probably the most um, uh, pivotal role in this movie. And, and from an actor standpoint, I think it's the most challenging because she has an estranged relationship with her son. Her son thought mm-hmm. she was insane. You know, you know, she was in the psycho hospital because, you know, she thought the world was going to end. Robots were coming, blah, blah, blah. So she, she has that relationship. You mentioned, you know, seeing that T-800. I love that scene where she's running and the Terminator just turns a corner and she's just like, <gasps> and the whole scene shot in slow motion. You can just mm-hmm. hear the terror, the fear in her voice. The score screen. that's going on. Yeah, I loved it. I loved it. Yeah. And not only that, she's dealing with knowing the world is going to end. Mm-hmm. And she's dealing with, okay, how do we stop this? So she's she's very conflicted. She's got a lot going on. And again, from a character standpoint, you mentioned, again, the humanity from the T-800. Every character has something very layered going on. But Sarah is probably the most, uh, from an acting standpoint, the most challenging and critical character. Because she's mm-hmm. got so much to face and she's got to deal with. Yeah. And she sells it, too. Just in that oh, sequence yeah, you man. were talking about. I mean, where she's, she's kicking ass and she's, you know got this elaborate plan to escape this hospital and, and she's one she's home free yeah and then the elevator opens and the t-800 walks out and it was, she's running from a group of people that are going to drug her and confine her for the rest yeah. of her life that she's basically terrified of one of them's borderline sexually assaulting her at night yeah and she oh, gets that one guy t- yeah <laughs> she looks at the t-800 and the fear that overcomes her outweighs anything that's behind her to where she literally runs into the arms of the people she was just scrambling yeah. away from and like a great shot you'll kill us all right you'll yeah. kill us all and then you get that great iconic switch of the line from the first one mm-hmm. where you know john connor calms her down for a second and you just get that that look from the, the floor of uh, arnold sure. schwarzenegger yeah. come with me if you want to live and it's like yeah, yeah! yeah. <laughs> especially if you watch them back to back it's just such a cool little switch there Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and then, yeah, the, the second half of the movie very much becomes a focus of John Connor trying to re- regain the relationship with his mother that he basically hates because yeah. he thinks she's nuts. He doesn't buy this savior bullshit. He doesn't buy this apocalypse or this legacy and fate and all that other stuff that she's been punching into him like a damn drug since he was a kid. And he resents her for, you know, basically stealing his child away, childhood away from him. Yeah. And now he's in this point where my mother was right. And now I need to repair things because she, you know, she was right. She gave away everything for me and we got to stop this thing. Mm-hmm. So you you have them linking up together and him trying to teach the T-800 humanity, teach him about children and, you know, why do you cry? Mm-hmm. And uh, giving him catchphrases, hasta la vista baby and stuff like that. It's just <laughs> a lot of really, a lot of really fun and like, quiet but like sweet scenes in the mm-hmm. middle of this action horror sci-fi extravaganza that's going on yeah m- much like the romance scene in the first film where you kind of take a pause and build out that this it's not so much a romance as it is that father-son relationship and yeah. uh then you have this whole test with um linda hamilton's character uh sarah connor where she finds the location of miles dyson who's the man who's most directly responsible for skynet being built Mm -hmm. and she goes to assassinate him and a really pivotal point for her character because where she i mean she lays waste to this house to where as far as she knew wife kids anybody else the little dog fido Mm -hmm. whoever the hell is in there with him is getting killed and i don't even care because i'm going to stop this she was a term she became a terminator for a brief moment in the movie yes Exactly. Yeah, she Mm -hmm. becomes the Terminator and becomes the killing machine that's going to stop at nothing. Mm -hmm. And then that glimmer of humanity hits there right there at the end when she has to face him on the ground begging with her, his kid kid. begging for his life, his wife begging for his life. And that's the moment the switch happens with her to um, to regain her humanity along Mm -hmm. with everything else that's happened. And then the third act is all about the assault on uh on this this building and taking out the the last bit of technology that's going to lead to skynet and the t-1000 descending and it's just action sequence after action sequence after action sequence throughout most of this film and the the t-1000 the t-1000 is actually he's gone for a good 40 minutes mm -hmm. in the movie i remember in the theater like the whole time they're in cyber systems trying to blow up the whole building and the t-1000 shows up like oh (laughs) 
<laughs> I forgot about this guy because you're so focused on this other plot. So, mm -hmm. it, yeah, I mean, it's, he's gone for for a long time, and he closes out the third act. I don't mean to cut you off. Go ahead. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. Please don't kill. Yeah, but interject as much as you want. I want to be back and forth. Oh, I uh, so uh, <laughs> you be quiet. Uh, but yeah, you have. Uh, so yeah, you have the Cyberdyne systems, the third act, all these action sequences, and. Um, it comes to a point where even after the evil is vanquished, it's like the, the ultimate climax of the movie isn't even the defeat of the T-1000. It's the having to let go of the T-800. Mm -hmm. And you, you uh, for a movie, ironically, that has a whole segment talking about why do you cry? I don't know any man that doesn't shed some man tears <laughs> when that score kicks in and he's descending down into that, you know, that yeah. molten and you have the thumbs up and oh, it's so good. Yeah. So, yeah, so you have the two stories here with Terminator and Terminator 2, one of them about, you know, this, this pursuit, this uh, this evil, relentless machine, this slasher movie, uh, the dangers of AI and a uh, romance in there. Second film, uh, switching the roles of the protector uh, and the in the pursuer, having an advancement of technology, going through the, the humanity of machines, as well as the humanity of humans and having the father-son relationship so for you mm. i know it's hard to pick which Ugh. movie reigns supreme as far as story oh god you have to put me in this position okay you know and i've been thinking oh, about yeah. this all day okay and i just want to say this before i give you an answer please do. uh t1 the original like i said is a great low budget horror movie in my opinion done right and it set up a world with endless possibilities that were finally explored in t2 t2 in my opinion, is is not a horror movie. Uh, the tone's completely different. It's it's very mm -hmm. action based. Yes. But again, seeing it again with my kids, like I said two years ago, they even said it themselves. This is kind of like a kids movie, Dad. I'm like, mm -hmm. what? What do you mean? Like, well, I mean, look at it. It's just like a father son thing. You know, he's teaching his dad how to be cool and say cool things. And I'm like, I never, <laughs> I never saw it that way. I never did. I'm like, oh my god, yeah. So I've seen it in a different light. Uh, as far as my favorites and. I'm I, I'm gonna have to go with T2 because okay. it hit me at a perfect age. Both made a big impact in my life. Like I said, I remember seeing them both. But just I was a freshman in high school. I was learning about movies. Arnold was the biggest movie star in the world. The special effects were groundbreaking. Everybody was talking about it. My favorite band, Guns N' Roses, had a fucking song in the movie, and is it was just a cool movie and a cool moment in in movie history. Like I said, I very a very, I, I rarely feel now. Where you go to a movie and it's so impactful that it's like, wow, I bet this is going to inspire directors and it's going to inspire people just to do things. And it, you hardly get that anymore. And it's so odd that I don't have that feeling. But just the oohs and ahs, the experience in just that movie of itself, I've seen it over. You know what? I stopped counting at 40. I've seen it over 40 times. Oh, wow. And that was only in the 90s. I stopped counting <laughs> in the 90s. So, so more 200 knows, I mean, now. Possibly, maybe more. But again, I'm going to have to go with T2 because again, it hit me at a moment in my life. And I, after that movie, I started walking around just with that mean face, mm -hmm. you know, like walking around like Arnold. I got a, a, a motorcycle jacket like Arnold. I had the glasses like him. It just impacted me like the, in the craziest way, dude. So T2 is my answer. All right. Uh, so for full transparency, both of these films are in my top chunk of, you know, favorite movies of all time. Absolutely. Uh, I, I grew up watching Terminator 2 long before I actually saw the first film. Uh, when I was growing up, I was pretty much just limited to whatever VHS is my dad owned. Uh, this is before Netflix and all that kind of stuff. So you, you, whatever dad had, that's what I was able to watch. And we had T2 as a VHS. I think it was a while before we had the first one. And I'll tell you what actually made me obsessed to where I had to get a copy of T1 to finally watch it was Encino Man. I'll be back. Yo, but shit. I know what you're the, talking about. Yeah. yeah, they had the scene where he's flipping through the TV and you get that one to, I'll be back. And then yeah. he crashes through and then he says it later on. Mm -hmm. I was like, that wasn't in T2. What is that movie? And then I had to, had to find it. Uh, so yeah, the first one, I have a lot of love for the first one for being so unique among the franchise. I love its simplicity. I love mm -hmm. how straight to the point it is. I love the fact that it's a slasher and it is a slasher. Do not argue with me in the comment section. You will lose. It's a slasher. <laughs> uh, and that's makes it just even just for the, the genre and the tone of the movie that it's going for is unique among the other, you know, four or five movies in the franchise. I love the romance angle in here. I think that it's, it's, 
an achievement in and of itself to have two characters that are together for just a short period of time and yet they're the the chemistry between them is so potent that they don't need to spend hours building out this romance for me to immediately buy it even for how short-lived that it is uh the way that they have the time loop thing going back around and make you question things after and debate things after is brilliant you get the t2 i'm somebody where you know we all have our emotional triggers both positive and negative with film and my most potent positive one is anytime there's anything regarding a father-son relationship it will break me no matter how you know how short it is in a movie that really just turns my emotions on uh and so that whole storyline is, is very much what makes t2 stand out to me is this this kid who has been fatherless finding that role in a machine and the machine finding his humanity along the way seeing uh sarah connor and her growth and evolution uh so for me as, as tight of a battle as it is i also have to give it to t2 judgment day i think it's the better story of the two uh and the fact that they're both by james cameron you know he, i think he knew exactly how to make a better story the second time around and there's a reason why we have not had another movie in the Terminator franchise since James Cameron has left that has gotten the response oh, that these God. two have. Let's not mention the other sequels. Let's not even go. <laughs> <laughs> Moving on to round two, we have characters. And there are some carryover characters here, but there's actually quite a few unique ones. Uh, so the first one, as we talked about, one of the, the character that's pretty much exclusive to the first film is Kyle Reese, played by Michael Bean, this warrior, this soldier sent back. Uh, who is as relentless with his mission as the machine is and um, is in love with Sarah Connor and volunteered to go back and uh, also is a guy that has grown up in this war-torn apocalypse that finally gets to go back and experience what the world was like before all of that happened, which the movie doesn't focus on too much, but has to be a bit of a mind fuck for him. Mm -hmm. and uh such a not only a strong character but just a strong actor like michael bean was damn near iconic yeah. in the 80s with things like this and aliens and even roles like the rock uh you know he just had such a great career there for a while there where he always mm -hmm. stood out mm -hmm. uh and so he he's kind of the main character that will as far as the first film that really makes that one feel unique from a character standpoint part one for you uh, well, I'm not picking my favorite. I'm just saying oh, that, okay. for that he's the he's the one piece of T1 that we don't get any shade of in the rest of the franchise. Well, we there were some deleted scenes in T2, but eh, that's yeah, another topic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> T2 theatrical cut versus director's cut. Let's go. And no, that's another two hours there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, uh, what what's your thoughts on the character of of Kyle Reese and like how do, is he the standout character at all in the first one, or is it still pretty much Sarah Connor for you? Uh, character for me mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. again i'm I, i'm going with the arnold arnold because mm -hmm. again from the presence that he did and again i know this this type of a role and movie mm -hmm. we've seen it a thousand times so the the goosebumps and the feel of it is kind of gone but again mm -hmm. i will remember how terrified i was scared of arnold schwarzenegger for a while mm -hmm. because of that movie and, and it wasn't until predator where i'm like oh he's kind of like a regular guy he's not a machine <laughs> underneath he's not gonna kill me then you saw kindergarten cop and it was like <laughs> oh we're, we're good we're good <laughs> <laughs> no, but again, from a presence, and again, think about what he had to do with no lines. I mean, uh, Kyle Reese and Sarah Connor, or you know, Michael Bean and you know, Linda Hamilton, they had lines, and they had all this time to kind of convey their emotions and what was going on, and that's obviously rightfully so because of the humans of the story. But for a, an, an actor with no experience, who just who's known for his size, to have to just act with this presence and face and very little words and to, to kind of resonate fear mm -hmm. to moviegoers, I got to fucking hand it to Arnold because not many people can do that and do it right. I mean, you can always have that big dude walking around and he's just, you know, whatever, but to convey like you're a machine mm -hmm. and just, you know, walk around and go into like a, I think for me, the scene where he goes into the, uh, the, the police station because she's safe. He's not going to get her. Either. She's surrounded by 30 cops mm -hmm. just to see that scene as a, as a, for a first time as a kid terrified the fuck out of me because he was just <laughs> killing cops left and right. I'm like, Oh my God. So yeah. again, I'm gonna have to go with Arnold with this because he did so much with very little script wise, and mm -hmm. he had to just rely on his presence and his actions. So my yeah, head, totally. It's have Arnold. you have you ever seen any of the interviews where he talks about like uh, the the nuances and things that he brought to the character that he doesn't even? I think people don't even realize. Or yeah, like reloading guns without looking. 
Yeah, all these yep. things where he's like, you got to be a robot. You, you you don't blink. You don't you know you don't even blink when you're running. It's just this relentless pursuit. You don't have to look where you're putting bullets in. You just know, and all these little subtle things that yeah. that add up to this uh, very convincing portrayal that you just almost take for granted if you don't hear him actually discuss how how into the character that he actually was. It wasn't just be big, talk robotic, and we'll go there. It was, it was way just more all to these, it. Yeah. yeah. Oh my God. All these little and, things. And the whole thing you said about not blinking, Robert Patrick actually learned that. Mm, so he not learned breathing. not to breathe and not to blink when he shot yeah. for T2. So like, oh my God. So it's those little details that you don't notice, but when you finally see them, like, oh, oh, mm -hmm. put a lot of work into this. But yeah. Arnold's and, my favorite character, the best one in part one. Part one. Yeah, gotcha. And so we were talking about the T1000. So we'll transfer, you know, over to Terminator 2 now. So uh, you have the T-1000 as a character in here that you know doesn't get near as much focus as the, the T-800 in the first film because there's just so much other things going on. As you said, there's a whole chunk of the movie where he just kind of disappears and we yeah. just kind of see him uh, like a scene with him on the motorcycle. Yeah, there uh, he is. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah, I forgot. Uh, but uh, a really interesting character because of how quickly he switches where, again, you, you don't really know if you're able, if you're blessed enough to watch this without having it spoiled for you or having the public you know, consciousness of pop culture uh yeah. that you think he might be the protector again because he has the kyle reese build and then he turns out to be the killer and doesn't matter if he's so much smaller than arnold he's just yeah. ferocious um and especially so, that one scene where he goes to meet the set parents like hey i'm looking for john connor he's a good looking boy you know where's he at yeah. he comes off like a hero like a good guy like wow yeah and he just changes big guy on a bike no i wouldn't worry about him <laughs> just that confidence yeah that cockiness <laughs> Oh, yeah. Uh, and then John Connor is the big addition in the second film where we talked about him a lot in the first film. And he's, you know, he's this a kid. this name, this messiah, this prophet, this idea. And then the second film, we actually get to see the living, breathing version of the character. And uh, I think pretty much universally, I think everybody thinks Edward Furlong is the best portrayal of that character. Oh, yeah. I've never really I never heard anybody that. argue too much else. Uh, but the the innocence as well as the attitude that he brings you see even as a young kid he's like 12 13 years old you're like oh yeah that's a leader that's yeah. a military leader you're like he could just you could tell that what he would grow up he would bring people together and and you know shove a nuke up their ass whatever he ends up doing <laughs> uh and i you know we talked pretty extensively in the story about the character arcs and the things that they go yeah. through here but you uh, you have sarah connor who is a very different character in this one than she was in the first film where she's innocent she's scared and she's uh, helpless through most of the movie and has to be protected where mm -hmm. she could almost be sent back to protect somebody in the second film because she's a, a Terminator in and of herself throughout much of it. Right. Uh, and then, you know, you also have uh, the, the T-800 here, who is, again, a very different version of the same character than he was in the first film, where he's relentless, evil pursuer, scary, terrifying, all the things that you were saying. And here, protector, curious, wanting to learn intrigued with humanity you know learns not to kill people you know yeah. he'll live shooting them in the kneecaps and things like that and <laughs> even by the end of it where you have the minigun scene and he's you know taking out all these vehicles yes. and he scans and zero casualties and it's like he he's learning humanity and the importance of humanity and there uh, there is one line though that kind of ruined it for me we, it was a big oh. laugh in the theater here we but go. He's going to take his point back. But there's one line <laughs> that, that, that Arnold does at T2 that was too silly in hindsight. Is at the end where he's just, you know, the, the T-1000 is dead and he's getting up. He goes, I need a vacation. I was like, oh, oh. Come on. I'm like, come on. That kind of ruined it for me. Arnold. That's come awesome. On. Don't you dare. No Terminator would ever ask for a fucking vacation, man. <laughs> when did he learn that? It's didn't brilliant. Teach him that? It's brilliant because he's horrible. in pieces. His arm horrible. is torn off. He's gotten the shit kicked out of him. He had to use his backup battery and everything. He, he does yeah. need a vacation. And he's, yes, he if deserves If they had a set it up earlier, like, God, I need a vacation after this, Mom. I know, I know. We'll go. You know, something like that. If they had mentioned it, maybe <laughs> I would have been okay. They brought it back. But here, just to bring a vacation out of nowhere, like, come on. I need, you know. I'm in need of repairs. This is what he should have said. I don't know, but not a vacation. <laughs> so that's the one line that kind of kills that moment for me. <laughs> so does that mean that you're giving your point for characters to T1 or, no. or how, where, where's your point going? No, my point. Well, I mean, as far as characters, I mean, for T2, it's still Sarah Connor for me. Like I told mm -hmm. you, she's just layered with so many items going on in her life. And, you know, the mm -hmm. estranged relationship with her son. Mm -hmm. Can I trust this machine next to me? You know, I, I can't take my eyes off him. You know, what mm -hmm. the hell should I do? And then knowing that the world is still going to end and having to go 
become a Terminator herself and go try to kill Miles Dyson. Uh, so as far as acting, that she's my favorite character now. Um, uh, in hindsight, looking back as an adult, she's my favorite character for T two. Mm-hmm. Sarah Connor. So, it's, so it's between, so layered. oh yeah, no, I 100 percent agree with you. Um, between the two movies, as far as characters, character me. work in the first film versus character work in the second film, God where's your me. point going to go? It's going to go to Sarah Connor. It's going to go to Sarah Connor in the second film. Yeah, it has to. Be. It's it's all just, right. It's, it's a lot right. tougher. Way more layered. It's funny. I, I hate you for curious. making me pick. <laughs> <laughs> it's like trying to uh, your son or your daughter. Who are you saving? <laughs> yeah, I know, man. That's one of the reasons why I picked this as the first one because it's it's going to be that that passionate love for both of these versus I hate like you, so much you loving one and I loving the other one and we got to debate back and forth. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I mean, it's it's hard, man. It's hard. Very because, hard. Again, like I've said, the, the I really love the love story and the protector role that Kyle Reese brings in that first film. And mm-hmm. I love seeing the growth of Sarah Connor in that first one, too, of somebody who's innocent and helpless and doesn't seem like she could protect anybody to this badass by the third act. And mm-hmm. uh, as I've said, the, the, the horror tones and the slasher approach that the T-800 has, I love all of that. Yes, but definitely. my point's going to go to T2 as well. Uh, and for all the basically the same reasons as story, story and characters are very interconnected for me. So it makes sense why I would prefer both in, in the same film. Yeah. Uh, I mean, just the way that John Connor and the, the the relationship that he has with the T-800, the relationship that he has with his mother, and the way that they're all just such deep layered characters in that second film. I love the simplicity of the first film, but the second one's mm-hmm. much more layered. And I like layered and complicated characters. So I'm going to yeah. I'm gonna give it to that point as well. And it done right with the right yes. actor and, and actress. I mean, Linda Hamilton, bravo. She fucking nailed it, man. Uh, I often say, I often say, and and another thing that I get a little bit of of shit for, I often say she's my favorite final girl. And she is a final girl in that first Who can argue with that? Uh, I mean, you'd be surprised, dude. The the gatekeepers, as far as terminology and genres and the the definitions of things, are outrageous. But yeah, for for me, cannot argue. She's my favorite, one of my favorite characters of all time. Uh, I mean, I I I may not agree with you, but I'm like, yeah, Mm -hmm. I see your point. There's like Mm -hmm. no arguing with that. I mean, yeah. 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 So I'm going to actually defer to you and kind of let you take a little bit of a lead on this third one. So the third okay. one is going to be about effects. Okay. And what I want from you, since you were, you got to see these in the theater, you were there at the time that these movies made their impact. Mm-hmm. Talk me through like some of the, the shock value or some of the amazement that you had watching the first film and seeing some of the effects with the Stan Winston robot, the cyborg look and the removing the eye and even some of the, the stop motion effects, which haven't aged so well in the first film, but at the yeah. time, talk me through how some of that hit you. Well, again, I was about maybe seven or eight years old when this movie came out in 84 and the whole scene where him having to, I guess, repair his eye with the, uh, the surgical tools, it looked fake as fuck. <laughs> it looked horrible okay <laughs> we all it looked horrible now it looks horrible not then. the direction that i was thinking this was gonna go i was gonna think it looks fake as fuck now but back then it was badass it looked no, horrible the- then because he's <laughs> okay. just he's just all robotic and you know mm-hmm. then he puts on the glasses it's like a nice cut i mean that's why i learned about editing i'm like oh i see what they did yeah. but it, it looked horrible then all right and it looked horrible it still looks horrible now but 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 the stop motion effects were to me very real because at the time you know the movies before then when it came to monsters you had stop motion like clash of the titans mm-hmm. and that was still scary especially the whole medusa scene i'm no i'm off topic there but that was still scary it looked fake but it was real enough especially mm-hmm. if they added cool sounds and uh seeing the t-800 rise from you know the the blown up uh truck and just walk after them it it was terrifying legitimately mm-hmm. terrifying because we had technically had never seen a robotic machine trying to kill people before we've seen the skeletons and all those other movies the old classic movies but here we had a robot with red eyes walking mm-hmm. to them and even it was still it even cut to a real uh model when it was like up here torso up and for those close-up shots and with the head moving scanning with the red eyes it was terrifying it looked real enough now believe it or not i saw like i said earlier i saw it with my kids two years ago and even though it was stop motion they were still scared, especially with that one scene where it's walking down the hallway and Kyle's trying to close the door and mm-hmm. you see the teed hunter coming through the door. My kids are like doing this like, <laughs> and he shuts the door and like, oh, and he's like banging on the door trying to get in. 
it's done well enough. It's a mixture of old school Hollywood stop motion. Then you have the Stan Winston model. I think that we've all seen that picture of that one guy who's got the T-800 torso on his shoulders walking around. Mm -hmm. it's, it's editing. It's, it's mixing practical and old school Hollywood magic. The sound design, I think, is what sells it too. Just, mm -hmm. to, just to hear him humming and all that, it just adds another layer of realism. It's done wonderfully. So again, mm -hmm. for part one, the face looks horrible as shit. <laughs> but it's E800, the explosions, and the uh, the, the fucking stunts. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were great, man. They were great. Yeah. And T2 Not to mention has my, I'm sorry. And T2 has one of my favorite stunts ever. And I'll go into that later. But that's all I got to yeah. say about T1. Yeah, and not to mention the first film, we also got to talk a little bit about gore effects. Now, there's not like a ton of them. It's not like a, a full on slasher splatter fest. But I mean, like no. I said, the first one of the first kills is him shoving his arm through somebody and pulling it out. And it's got it's blood Bill all Paxton, over right? him. And, uh, he, he Bill, feels... it, it, the guy who's with Bill Paxton. I think he's the guy who's the bad guy in Cobra, if I'm not mistaken. Or Shang Tsung um, in Mortal Kombat, I think is what it is. Yeah, the Cobra guy. Yeah, that Cobra. One, Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that guy. Wash day tomorrow. Nothing clean, right? <laughs> <laughs> exactly Again, right so you do have some gore here and and with the kills that they're 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 meaner they're meaner in the first film you know the, the mm -hmm. there's not the glorification of the action so much in the second film onward it's like you know, these people are getting ripped apart yeah and um that that's where it always brings that that horror tones for me but yeah no the i agree brutal with you kill, I, in my opinion for part one for him is when he kills sarah connor's roommates mm -hmm. that's kind of just like a killer he just walks into this room he just brutally beats up the boyfriend and then just shoots his girl helpless girl running away mm -hmm. from him that's kind of like another layer of like my god this guy's relentless man but oh yeah again yeah, it's sure. terrifying it's a terrifying movie it is it, it's got some some great tension going on there but yeah I, I agree with you when i grew up even as a kid i, I always kind of poked fun at the the stop motion and everything with the the yeah. fake head and the eye. I, I was very curious if, if it looked better back when oh, it, it was brand it new. It looked like shit then. It looked like oh, shit. Man. People uh, laughed in the theater. That's how bad it was. Oh, it's never good. <laughs> but yeah, uh, the, the, the Stan Winston effects that were awesome all the way back to the day. Like I think those are the ones that really stood the test of time. And even as a low budget movie back in 84, everybody was like, I've never seen anything like this. Just yeah. this, the, the cyborg look and the the skeletal design that has it's almost too human even though it's something monstrous to it and all the that one stuff scene is that awesome. was scary to me as well is uh, what we haven't talked about is the future sequences uh that oh John yeah has in, yeah in the in the dream sequences he has especially that, when that's the, a good point too because if the 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 different aerial planes and everything like that we haven't yeah. talked about any of that yeah. yeah and most of it's done with rear projection i believe but again mm -hmm. uh the one scene that terrified me is when uh john's in that one human sanctuary whatever they think they're safe in the t 800 walks in and he's just the killing everybody. Start barking yeah and he just sees it and it's just this guy silhouetted with the light behind him with a gun mm -hmm. with red, red eyes. eyes that's fucking terrifying dude and i wish more terminator movies kind of brought that horror element back like yeah give us some action but these things mm -hmm. are fucking terrifying because they look like us. I'm really As hoping it's fucking oh, awesome. Yeah. No, I'm with you, man. I'm with you. I, I uh, I'm hoping that the success of Prey, going back to basics, going back to the tone of the first film, as far as Predator goes, and seeing the success of that, I, I'm hoping that kind of adjacent franchises like Terminator that have just gotten so big and big and big after T2, ridiculously big, and, yeah. yeah, that they're going to start to scale back. And if we ever do get another Terminator film, I hope we get somebody who has the passion for the tone of the first film and goes back to that and doesn't just try to make a blockbuster again because i they think that's scary yes oh exactly. man that'd be cool we need that again let's do it me yep. and you <laughs> Fuck uh, <yeah. laughs> uh so the effects of the second film now this to me of all of the movies that we look back on even even as as close back as 10 years ago that you look at some of the cgi and you go "Ooh, that looks bad now uh yeah. and, and there's plenty of movies that look bad the weekend it comes out Terminator 2 from 1991. I mean, I've watched this movie as recent as last year. Mm -hmm. To me, it still looks great. And yeah. it's the simplicity of the effects that they go for, specifically with the T-1000, just that liquid metal look mm -hmm. was unlike anything that ever been seen at that point. And it still looks convincing. It doesn't look like early 90s, you know, prototype CGI. Mm -hmm. And all of the effects that were so good and so impressive in the, the first film are nothing but better here yeah. uh the the future sequences where the, the the skull and the foot crushes it and you have mm -hmm. the cyborgs that are just shooting things and the aerial yeah. vehicles and the effects with the explosions and even some of the it, it's not quite as bloody but even the the kills that we get here like the one where he 
does the finger through the dude's eye and he's just oh, sitting there yeah. hanging from it or the the one where he she's on he's on the phone as the foster mother and just yeah. does that and yeah. it's the this foster father with the milk jug yeah like it, it's 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 convincing it looks yeah. like there's a blade great. In his face yeah yeah it looks great uh yeah i mean the uh the kills are definitely a lot better uh the more gruesome like you said uh but again the special effects in my opinion ground fucking breaking dude ground mm -hmm. fucking breaking just like i said just to the excitement of wanting to go to a movie to see the special effects and i think that excitement again is gone because mm -hmm. all movies look great no matter what i mean there's this kind of like a dead give, dead given but at this time it was new it was called morphine i remember hey they have this technology where they morph into other people it's called morphine morphine's a medicine rudy it's not what it's called i'm like it's called fucking morphine it doesn't yeah. i remember getting into a big <laughs> argument with my teacher <laughs> it's called morphine michael jackson's gonna do it in one of his videos later but anyway yeah just the uh the uh just seeing like wow we're in the future because it's a future movie tied to ai and robots but to see this technology and this special effect looks so good man just that ooh and awe in the theater man is is an experience i'll never forget it's very similar to the t-rex walking out in jurassic park just like mm -hmm. oh my god that thing looks fucking real it's amazing so uh the, the the effects are amazing the stunts are great there's one thing that's kind of silly is when the t-1000s on the car and they're leaving the hospital and you can obviously tell it's a dummy that I always laugh at that one scene. <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, whatever. But uh, my it suck when you just like you could watch it a thousand times, and yeah. then the one time that you notice something, now yeah. you can never watch it without noticing yeah. that. I noticed it day I, one. I was like, oh, okay, oh, really? that's fine. Yeah, I had it happen with Commando, where he, you know, oh, I told you, you last, Sully, and then you pick him up, oh, and once the Blu-ray hit, where everything was high definition, you can see <laughs> the, you can see the wire with yeah. his foot. And it's like, oh, no, Arnold's really that strong. You just ruined it for me. Oh, and then the soldiers kind of like flipping in the air. And you can see that little trampoline kind of go off the ground and knock the soldiers yeah. out of the air. <laughs> it's so bad. But anyway, back to Terminator. Terminator <laughs> T2, again, the special effects. And again, just to uh, to see that uh, the Robert Patrick, the T-1000, freeze with liquid nitrogen. That mm -hmm. whole scene was fucking like, wow, he's dead. And then you see the lava coming and him melting, coming back together and kind of rising again groundbreaking but again as far as i want to talk about stunts and the special effects because this movie has one of my favorite stunts that to this day i get goosebumps and i'm like fuck yes is when they're headed to that plant right they're in that that truck that they stole from the guy and you have the terminator the t-1000 in that big truck with the liquid nitrogen and they're really on top of each other right arnold says grab the wheel whatever he gets out of the truck goes to the bed of the truck he gets on the hood he gets on the front of the windshield just, and just unloads on the driver. That mm -hmm. is my favorite stunt sequence ever. Oh, really? It, ever. Because, it, it, dude, the cars are going fucking fast. They actually had a stuntman do that. It's all in one shot. But just, and then you just see the T-1000 just going into the middle of pieces. Dude, I'm, t I'm getting goosebumps right now. But that sequence is my favorite live stunt ever. That's part of the magic of that second film is that, it, I mean, it kicks off with awesome stunts and awesome action yeah. sequences. And you keep thinking you've seen the best one the movie has to offer. And they always got another one coming down. Yeah. And I mean, that's you're talking the last 15 minutes of the movie at that point mm -hmm. when it has your favorite stunt of all time. And even the one uh, where I mean, where the, the truck eventually flips over and he oh, yeah. he's, he's got to do the, like a little <laughs> barrel roll off of yeah. it and like. All that stuff is great. Uh, and even the effects of the, the T-1000 as he gets damaged, where uh, like yeah. especially at the end where he blows up and it's, it's Robert Patrick's head and it's got the, <laughs> the arms this way and the foots this way. Yeah. And falls yeah. into the pit and he starts to remorph into all the characters that he imitated throughout the movie. And mm -hmm. God, it's so fucking good. Yeah. Um, so I'll lead off this one. So as somebody that uh, had to appreciate these effects even after they were groundbreaking for the time, uh, so I was probably maybe four or five when I watched this for the first time. So four or five years after T2 had already made its impact. Again, I got to give it to T2. Uh, I mean, I love what they did for a low budget with the first one, but the second one to me to this day still looks awesome. And there's, I mean, I can maybe count on two hands, maybe even one hand, how, how many movies from the 90s that use special effects to that degree still are convincing to this good. day. Yeah. yeah. Not many, not many, not many. Uh, I would have to go to T2 as well. I mean, <laughs> God damn it. I we hate love this. T2. I know, but it's so hard because they were both at the time, considering mm -hmm. the technology that they had to work with, were both groundbreaking. Yep. And like I said, uh, T1 was a mixture of old Hollywood, new Hollywood, stop motion, and 
it's it, I, I don't want to take I don't want to take anything away from that. But again, mm-hmm. when you look at T two and the legacy and just the, the the cultural impact that the, that that special effect was so convincing. Hell, Michael Jackson stole it for Remember the Time. That mm-hmm. was the next major thing we saw that had that morphing technology. And yeah. even Michael Jackson, you remember he put sand. I don't know if you've seen the video, but he, he rises up like a T one thousand and he starts dancing. Rip so off. yeah. Because it was that good. I don't want to do that now. And then they fucking did. <laughs> <laughs> so moving on to round four, we're going to discuss the villains of these two movies. Now, obviously, Skynet is the overarching villain of the entire franchise. AI as, a, as an idea. Uh, yeah. But the first film, you have the T-800, Arnold Schwarzenegger. The second film, you have Robert Patrick's T-1000. So it really comes down to the differences in the nuances and the performances. It comes down to what terrifies you. It comes down to the tone of the movie. Uh, The first film, as we've discussed a lot of times is very much a a horror film. I I go even further and say it's a slasher film. I mean, you have this character who is the, you know, a Michael Myers, Jason Voorhees type of pursuer only going even a step further than those because Michael Myers uh, and Jason Voorhees still has, little flavors of human in them with the way that they tilt their head or the way that you know jason recognizes his mother's sweater or there, there's these shades of the human that used to be yeah uh, the, okay. the monster used to be okay you don't have that in the t-800 he's just evil he's, he's just machine. relentless pursuit mm-hmm. you know you can't be bargained with you can't all, all that stuff he, you were saying earlier doesn't feel uh, pity remorse yeah. fear <laughs> And it absolutely her, will not stop. And rip her fucking you. heart out. Yes. <laughs> oh, I'm gonna watch it again tonight. I have to. Yeah. I gotta uh, go see that action sequence. I told you about that stunt. I watch it on YouTube. <laughs> it's so fucking good, dude. Bring the whole family down. Hey, watch this. Like, oh, that was my my reaction to the like. Oh my god, that was fucking yeah. cool. <laughs> I'm gonna try to do that on, on uh, Hill Divers. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> there we go. Rudy, do the T1. Yes. Oh man. Yeah. Oh man, that's great. Uh, but yeah, so you have this guy who is, I mean, a terrifying villain in the first one. Uh, from the performance to the concept to the tone of the movie to the the different sequences, and they continue to ramp up how pers- how 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 relentlessly pursuing this character is from. Yep. Uh, the quiet beginnings to him mowing down anybody with Sarah Connor's name to the relentless pursuit of the two of them when they're together to the break into the police station all the way to his skin getting melted off in the explosion. And you just have the, the robot endoskeleton coming after them with everything Everybody. that he's got. doesn't matter what damage this thing has does not stop until it is completely obliterated. Yeah. Uh, and you have very much the same thing with the second film. Only, like I said, a little bit more of an elusive elusive mm-hmm. character not so much a uh, uh, just like this pit bull that has been released uh this rabid dog it's somebody that is trying to outsmart the uh the target trying to mm-hmm. outsmart the humans and trying to uh, lay a plan and stay 10 steps ahead of them and wait and you know per- yeah pretend to be the foster mother for presumably hours waiting for john connor to come home uh going into the hospital and and mimicking one of the cops and getting the vehicle that he needs to eventually find them at Cyberdyne and all those different things. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and then the performances, we talked a little bit about it earlier too, but just the way that Arnold commits to the role with the nuances of the machine and his physicality. And then you got the same thing with Robert Patrick uh, running without breathing, running without blinking and the, the, mm-hmm. the facial expressions that he has where he's very convincing as a charming guy, somebody that you're like, this guy's a good guy. I can trust yeah. him to very much looking like this evil pursuer uh so again this one is tough man this one is tough what is it yeah is is it i I think i kind of spoiled it for for everybody already when i mentioned arnold (laughs) i mean it's for me the the villain is the best is part is t1 is arnold like i said (laughs) again just not to repeat myself but again just with very little lines just using his presence and using Mm -hmm. uh like you said everything he learned just uh the fierceness and just being very robotic and reloading guns and just walking Mm -hmm. through crowds and just Getting people out of the fucking way like i need the phone and he just pulls that guy off the phone you remember that one scene <laughs> yeah. it's, it's just he's unstoppable he's unstoppable mm-hmm. and again i think that's a testament to arnold's acting again one of his first movies and it just showed us all a glimpse of what he is capable of doing mm-hmm. so again villain no doubt is is arnold t1 not to take anything away from robert patrick because he did a great job as well but again 
mm-hmm. Arnold set the bar and he kind of got this whole franchise. Yeah. So the difficulty with me is that I've said so many times, all the times that I've talked about this franchise or these individual films, that the T-1000 is the best Terminator in this franchise, the best piece of technology. From a standpoint, yes. To the point where it feels (laughs) like all of the movies, with the exception of Dark Fate, because I do like what they did in Dark Fate, all the movies, one of the biggest downfalls of part three, and uh, especially part three, is trying to figure out how to top the T-1000. Yeah. And you can't. You, you can't, can't have a piece of technology that tops that. You can make him a woman like you did in T-3. It was all right. But no, yeah. You, you, you can't inflate her it. tits. Yeah. That was pretty cool. <laughs> I like that. That was pretty cool. You and Brian got to talk about T-3 at some point. I don't know if you're a T-3 <laughs> defender or not, but Brian it's passionately okay. despises that movie. It's okay. Despises. I would never defend it or waste energy <laughs> to defend that movie. <laughs> It's okay. Uh, so, being that I said that the T-1000 is the best piece of technology, spec-wise, as far as Terminators, the, the different shades of villains and Skynet technology we've been given, I'm also going to give the point to Terminator 1. Uh, I, I think that the T-800 is a more iconic villain. I think the performance is a bit more iconic. I, I, the, the tone yeah. of the movie makes the T-800 scarier, even though the T-1000 is much more of an advanced piece of technology. I feel like I would feel safer with that thing coming after me than the t800 and the in the pursuit of that first movie Uh so i'm in agreement with you i'm in agreement with you we're both going for the villain in terminator the original all right 84 now we are on to the final round round five and this is interesting because it's going to be very subjective to us we're going to talk about the legacy legacy of these individual movies the legacy for our own film fandom the legacy for how they impacted maybe hollywood or movie making or stories going forward uh and it's going to be a very different perspective because obviously you were there you were able to see how these movies impacted hollywood probably and and the 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 movies that were inspired by it and um and even how people consumed movies to a certain extent where i'm very much kind of playing catch up with having to play having, having to watch these films as a kid years later uh so for me the the terminator's legacy i mean there's a lot of things first of all it kicks off the career of james cameron who it's hard to argue he's not maybe the most successful director of all time no Uh, i mean he's got basically all hits as far as his movies we all have our favorites but there's there's very few people you talk to where they're like that movie sucks when you talk to a a james cameron film again we're not counting piranha 2 he, he yeah. <laughs> only directed that technically. <laughs> um, so then you get to get the guy that gives us true lies. You get the guy that gives us aliens, Terminator two, Avatar, um, Avatar, Titanic. I wish we could get more movies besides Avatar out of this era of James Cameron. But nonetheless, we have Avatar. Uh, you know, he he has the the top. Well, for the longest time, he had the the top two highest grossing films of all time. Uh, now he shares the top three, I believe, with uh, Endgame. But mm-hmm. still, two films that made over $2 billion. Mm-hmm. And uh, the, the legacy of it as far as... Uh, this is uh, one of the first movies that really started to play with time travel the way that it did. And talking about fate. Yeah. And, you know, there, there's, there's, there's a lot of time travel stories going back, I mean, all the way to Twilight Zone and stuff. But the way that it did it and blending romance and everything in there and taking a simplicity, a simplicity approach to it was very groundbreaking for the time. Kicked off the career of Arnold Schwarzenegger, too. Can't ignore that. I mean, that guy, especially as a kid, was my hero. That was my favorite actor for a long chunk of my life. Really? Um, whether okay. it, yeah, whether it be Total Recall, Commando, Kindergarten Cop, even Batman and Robin for a long time. I was a fan of as a kid. I was the target audience for that piece of shit. Um, I walked out of that movie. <laughs> <laughs> I wanted to walk back in and watch it again. Oh, it was uh, so horrible. I, I was six years old, so the the, the toy yeah. commercial thing was for me. Yeah, But nonetheless, yeah, so you give birth to, I mean, what I would say is probably the most iconic action star of all time. I mean, it's pretty hot debate between him and Stallone. I think Stallone's probably the better actor mm-hmm. of the two. Better if writer. Was, yeah. yeah, better writer. Uh, maybe maybe a bit more different facets of talent, but yeah, uh, I think that Arnold Schwarzenegger's movie slate as a whole is better. Ooh, you know what? That'd um, be a good episode of Arnold versus yeah. Sly, because I'm Sly all the way, dude. I love. Oh, really? I love Sly. Gotcha. Uh, every facet man. i do too i do too yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. uh so you have that and um i mean that those are all the things that are the legacy of terminator for me so what, what's the the legacy i'm sure you agree with a lot of what i just said but what's the legacy of the original film for you uh, 
the original film or both? Original. The original. Well, like I said, the, the legacy, like I said, for me, it's just, it was in, in essence a low budget movie with an unknown actor. And again, this didn't an have unknown any, director. an unknown director. So it, again, it, it wasn't expected to be anything. It was just really a lot of word of mouth. And I, it really didn't make a huge impact uh, for me and my friends because my sister took me to see this, but and she shouldn't have because it was rated R, but I wanted to see it. <laughs> but um, I think she was, she was on a date. She was like, want to go to the movies with me? And I did, and I saw it, and it freaked me out. But again, once it went on HBO is when all my friends started knowing about it and talking about it, and that's when it became word of mouth. And uh, as far as cultural legacy, I think it'll always have that glimmer of hope for every future of uh, movie maker out there. Like you don't need a big budget. You just need a, a strong story, great actors in the right role and a right director. When all that comes into play, it doesn't matter the money you have. You can make a movie that, you know, almost 40 years later, we're still talking about it set the tone. It set and opened up a new genre. Like you said, tr time travel, I AI, you figure that with these both movies, we would have learned our lesson by now. But now to this day, right now, we're toying with AI and we're fucking with it. So, oh, my God, it, man. Scary, man. I, I say it all the time. I'm like, Skynet's going to win. Every time yeah. I see something new where they, they had the George Carlin, you know, yes. AI thing where it literally sounds like him and his comedy. And it's just like, this is not it good. Why me. is this celebrated? This is terrifying. Have you seen that new technology where you just type in what you want and it's lifelike video? It's it's text to video. I'll show you after the podcast. It's fucking insane. <laughs> But anyway, we didn't learn a damn thing from these movies. So again, mm -hmm. it's just a matter of time before Skynet takes over. But anyway, it, it just opened up a whole new genre. Like I said, as far as legacy, I think T2 has a stronger legacy. And I, I think we're <laughs> going to touch on that next. So I don't want to say too much. Mm -hmm. Well, go uh, ahead. Talk about T T2's legacy. You could transition over. Okay. Well, for, for me, it that one definitely holds a stronger legacy because what did we see after T2? We saw a cultural like a uh, infusion you like you said encino man i totally forgot about that scene but you know people started mocking the movie i remember this yeah. one kid in the american pie movies who kept saying that he was i'll be back he kept quoting the, <laughs> the terminator. terminator yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it, it made an impact with a us. sophisticated it, sex robot sent back through time to change the future <laughs> for one lucky lady i am lucky lady that's right nadia you've been targeted for shermanation come with me if you want to live <laughs> i forgot all about that but that's exactly oh, what i haven't that's my childhood it should be my teenage <laughs> years but it was my childhood i was only nine but i watched oh my that god <laughs> but it, it, we didn't have that after terminator there wasn't other movies making fun of the terminator and this one again it just kind of just spread out and maybe because it had mtv involved you know axel rose and guns and roses but everybody was just talking about it it was mocked it was parodied on saturday night live and again special effects tone and action this kind of set the bar this inspired i don't know how many filmmakers to this day who consider that you know i went and saw t2 and inspired me to make movies and mm -hmm. it's it's considered one of the pillars one of the i guess the mount rushmore of action movies summer blockbusters that we're we're still to this day trying to replicate and uh, it's very few that have come close to that mm -hmm. again i mean we've had summer blockbusters every summer since then but how many of them are we talking about like yeah. we are the t1 t2 and again, as far as legacy, I think from a special effects standpoint, an adventure action standpoint, a storytelling standpoint, and having the, the biggest actor in the world is is this a, a, a bottle, lightning in a bottle, the perfect storm, everything housed at the perfect time, a right time with technology, everything just came in when it needed to come. And again, that holds a stronger legacy. But again, not to take anything away from T1, but again, mm -hmm. from a cultural standpoint and inspiring others, T2 by a fucking landslide, man. Interesting. Uh, I'm going to bring a point up and see if you agree as far as uh, maybe a negative side of the legacy of T2. Okay. Uh, I can't think of one of the first film. Maybe you can correct me on that one. But the something about I agree with everything you said, by the way, as far as positives. It, again, every every single one of these categories is a tight race for both of these films. Yeah, it's, yeah. Uh, but as far as a negative is and the legacy of T2 that uh, certainly will will possibly impact my decision. Um, I feel like T2 for his unbelievable as it is also set this precedent that it's almost like we learned the wrong lessons from it where even just within the terminator franchise if we just want to talk about this franchise itself they have completely lost sight of how to tell good stories in these movies uh with with few exceptions or, or what makes the first two films so great i guess i should say more correctly because t2 was just let's do this but let's do it bigger bigger concepts bigger themes bigger stunts bigger action sequences and they've been chasing that ever since we got to outdo mm. t2 and they can't outdo t2 and even in blockbuster filmmaking or sequelizing things 
we got to do the T2 approach. Let's do that, but bigger, bigger yeah. explosions, bigger concepts. And I would say more times than not uh, in the time since 1991, that's not the right approach for the movie. That's not the right approach for the franchise. We can even go to something like The Matrix, which I think is probably heavily inspired by The Terminator in many ways. Yeah. First film, wild concept, uh, absolute classic, groundbreaking for its time. What do they do for the sequels? Let's do yeah. that, but bigger. Bigger yeah. concepts, bigger, more convoluted lore, uh, bigger action sequences, bigger CGI. They look like PS2 characters. And so that's something that, not to say that it's all T2's fault. I mean, just as T2 is one of those sequels, much like Aliens. Yeah. Where, again, James Cameron sequel. Let's do it bigger. Let's go badder. And he knows how to do it right. But so many other filmmakers or at least studios miss the point when they try to do that. Yeah, I think money definitely is a big motivator when it comes to that because mm -hmm. James Cameron, he said this many times that there was no more story after part two. Yeah, like he even had filmed an alternative ending where it was that was it. You know, they were living happily ever after, and that was mm -hmm. they were going to not move on for anything. And it took years for them to convince James Cameron, I think, to like at least endorse or maybe like let go of the rights so they can do T three. Arnold mm -hmm. didn't want to do it. He, I think, he admitted he did it for money. He did. Uh, yeah, and there's there's no more story in that, and I think that's from a uh, if he owned an IP, it's kind of tough because again, what's the bottom line with these, these studios? You want to make money. And that's a uh, marketable IP. But again, they've ruined that legacy in a sense after T2. The, all these other films that have come out have been very subpar. Uh, the one that I did enjoy was the one with um, what the, Christian Bale. Salvation. I, yeah, I really enjoyed the different take to that. It, at mm -hmm. least it had the balls to do something different. And that's probably my third favorite Terminator movie out of all of them. Because again, I it, really it, like Salvation, so I'm with you on that one. It's and I'm not one of the, bad, like people make it out to be. I mean, no, it, it's not. No, it's a good film. It, it, it's very different. I mean, I hated the marketing of it because they gave away the plot twist, which yeah. just infuriated me. But uh, yeah, I loved it because it's weird. It's it, the way that the time loop works. Uh, it's a prequel as well as a sequel. Yeah, you know what I mean. It takes place before these movies, but it also takes place after. It's it's very interesting. Again, that that whole mind fuck of time travel rules. But yeah, yeah I love Salvation. I'm, I'm a big fan of that one. I'm actually one of the people that love. Dark Fate. Dark Fate would be my, my number three. I thought the really? Dark Fate was awesome. Yeah. I yeah. like I mean, the villain. A, I like the villain, the, uh, the Mets. Red Nine. Yeah, I, I did like him, but um, uh, the whole story, I don't know. I don't know. I'm not a fan of it. That's a video for another time. Uh, yeah. Best T2 secret. <laughs> T3 <laughs> or T Salvation versus Dark Fate. Uh, yeah. But yeah, so that would be my my only thing that I would throw in to the discussion of the legacies. Yeah. Uh, so with That's that a being said, point. yeah, with that being said, you're sticking with T2? I'm sticking with T2. Yes, because I was there. And my God, things so changed after that. Everything changed after that movie. So it's, uh, we're still, like I said, we're still talking about it almost 40, oh, yeah. 30 years later, man. It's an amazing movie. Gotcha. Uh, this one is the hardest category of all of them for me because it is. Yeah. T2 is, overall is more important for me. It, it's a film that's higher on my top list. It's a movie that, like, uh, I mean, for again, full transparency, this is my second favorite film of all time, only um, preceded by Die Hard. And if you ask me on a certain day, <laughs> I might I might try to regret that. I mean, they might as well be tied for number one. I fucking love Terminator 2. Yeah. Uh, and I agree with everything you said regarding the legacy. And I think that it's the one that penetrated the pop culture consciousness a lot more and has a lot more mm -hmm. of the catchphrase. Hasta la vista, baby. I mean, we, we all say that. We grew up saying that in the 90s. Yeah. So many things about this, even making like motorbikes and the 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 sunglasses cool to where now yeah. you can't have arnold schwarzenegger in a terminator movie without sunglasses it's just like <laughs> part of his character so many things yeah but i'm gonna give my point to the first film i'm actually really my point to the first film yeah uh, okay I feel like the 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 things about the the impact that it had for for so many like as far as kicking off his franchise kicking off the career of james cameron kicking off the career of arnold schwarzenegger um having this this low budget uh, low budget simplicity with excellence that I, I really love to see in these old school films uh, that didn't really have a ton of money and had to get creative. There's so much about this first film that uh, if I had to choose which one I feel like had the greater impact on the world that I appreciate more, I feel like I got to give the point to that one. So that's the first category that we're going to be split on. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Okay. Okay. I, I can't argue with that. I mean, <laughs> I, I mean, 
every every it's crazy. The legacy category I was a little curious on. I was like, I don't know where we're gonna land on that one because there's so many different things, but every single category with these two films is like, oh, do I have to pick? Yeah, and that's awesome. That just speaks to how awesome both of these films are, where it's just like it doesn't matter which one's better, we win. Mm-hmm. <laughs> They're both fucking great. And honestly, I love again both these movies. I think we spoke about both of them in a very high regard. I mean, mm-hmm. ask me on a different day, I probably would have given a different answer. But again, I was there for T2. And again, as a young teenager, God damn, mm-hmm. man, that movie just, just changed everything, man. And it, the, the, the score, I remember just buying the score. That was the first movie soundtrack I ever bought mm-hmm. and just put the tape in and played it when I worked in the gym. So <laughs> it's the stupidest thing. Oh, things, it gets man. you pumped. Dun, dun, yeah. Dun, dun. Yeah. Absolutely gets you pumped. Well, so looking at the scoreboards, the final score for Terminator 1, we have three points out of a possible 10. Mm-hmm. And Terminator 2, we have seven. So mm-hmm. uh, not quite a landslide victory, but pretty damn close. No, very uh, and the only one that we disagreed on was Legacy. So, yeah, I mean, look, the lesson to be learned here, if you haven't seen these two films, and I don't know why you would have the story spoiled by us knuckleheads, <laughs> but uh, T1 and T2, make it a part of your life. Make it a part of your, uh, your, your priorities for the week because two of the greatest movies of all time. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yep. Yeah. Must see. Absolutely. Well, that's going to be it for this first episode of Movie Brawl, guys. Terminator 2 reigns supreme. What do you think? Let me know down in the comment sections on each of these categories, or you can just give me a little diatribe about which one should have won. Let me know your thoughts on these two films and which one you think should have won the Movie Brawl.